Chapter 16 In the excitement of the night, Martine had forgotten about the poachers and the fact that she was miles from home, with dawn rapidly approaching. Even supposing she was able to steer Jimmy, who was not, after all, a schooled horse, in the general direction of the house, there was no way she could allow him to leave the secret valley if there was any possibility that the hunters were still out looking for him. After a last bemused glance at the giraffe paintings, Martine ran to the cave exit and slipped and slithered back down the rocky steps, adding a fresh layer of moss to her jeans. The tunnel seemed longer than she remembered, and she was very grateful to reach the tranquil valley and hear the welcoming call of the white giraffe. She rushed over to Jimmy, put her face against his velvet fur, and cuddled him for several minutes. Only then did she switch off her flashlight and grope her way to the valley entrance. Standing on a rock, she peered over the edge of the crevice. The dense foliage of the tree blanketed out most, but not all, of the view. A stamp-sized gap showed a patch of sky, which was that brilliant blue that precedes first light. Martine could also make out the front half of the poacher's rusting Ford pickup. It was empty. Seeing the truck gave her an idea. Like a lot of her ideas recently, it was a bit crazy, but if it worked, it would be the perfect solution. She was going to get the poachers to give her a ride home. Martine ran through the dark valley to Jimmy's side. She stood on tiptoes, and he put his head down and nuzzled her affectionately. "'Stay safe, my beautiful friend,' she said. A little self-consciously, she added, "'I love you.' She returned to the valley entrance, climbed cautiously over the sharp rocks that guarded it, and began to wriggle through the tangle of st sticky creepers. Lying on her belly beneath the sinister tree, she waited and listened. Twin points of light were bobbing through the trees. The poachers were returning to their vehicle. For a second, Martine's limbs were filled with the same helpless weakness she'd felt on the night of the fire, but she propelled herself forward. If she hesitated now, it was over. Tearing herself free of the vines, she sprinted for the truck and flung herself on the back. A tarpaulin lay in a heap near the cab. Martine dived under it, gagging at its rotten meat odor. Then she lay still. She hardly dared breathe. Footsteps crunched across the stony ground. The truck rocked as the men got in and the door slammed with an unnecessary force. They weren't speaking. Despite her predicament, Martine managed a smile. She pictured them seething, each blaming the other for a wasted, torturous night among the creepies and crawlies. With any luck, it had them put them off hunting for life. The old truck gave a harsh metal wheeze and jolted into action. Martine's plan was to wait until the poacher slowed down to open a gate or cut the fence and then jump out. Assuming that she didn't injure herself in the fall, she would then be within easy walking distance of the house. In the meantime, she was determined to try to get a good look at the men. Using the tarp as a cover, she raised herself up inch by inch until her eyes were level with the bottom of the dusty cab window. The first pink stirrings of dawn were in the sky, and Martine saw immediately why she'd found it so difficult to make out the features of the men at the waterhole. They were dressed in gray long sleeve shirts, and black ski masks covered their faces. All could she could see was their hands, the driver's powerful paws gripping the wheel, and his accomplice's hairy ones holding his rifle. She lay back down again. One of the men was black, with a tattoo of a tiger on his wrist, and one was white. It didn't really tell her anything. It didn't even tell her if they were the same men who had shot her grandfather and the two giraffes. A light bulb went off in her head. What if the clue lay not with the men, but with the giraffe? From what Tende said, the police and everyone at Sawabona had always assumed that the poachers had been after ordinary giraffes, mainly because it was ordinary giraffes that had been found dead, and most people believed that the white giraffe was only a legend. But what if they had been trying to catch the white giraffe instead? That would change everything. Martine wriggled deeper into the folds of the stinking tarpaulin. It made total sense. 
for the poachers to have known of the white giraffe's existence they must have had very close links with sawabona that meant they were either friends or relatives of someone who worked on the game reserve or they worked at sawabona themselves martine shivered at the thought of these possibilities she knew that alex had befriended her grandfather in the year before he died and had been promised the job of game warden if anything ever happened to him alex had also threatened martine herself had shot the kudu and found it amusing and had made it clear that he knew the value of the white giraffe and was very sure it existed but maybe he was too obvious a suspect in martine's mum's favorite detective show the villain had never turned out to be the weird postal worker with the limp or the gun enthusiast or the eccentric wart-ridden spinster it was always the least obvious person the clean-cut doctor the wholesome housewife or the new vicar the least obvious person at sawabona was and martine felt guilty for even thinking such a thing tende he claimed he'd been away in the north of the country at the time of the shooting visiting his relatives but what if he hadn't been away at all what if he'd been right here what if the reason he didn't find the poacher's tracks was because he didn't want to but no that didn't work either because martine refused to believe it was true she would trust tende with her life the vehicle slowed martine readied herself for the jump she dreaded to think what would happen if the driver or his gun-toting companion noticed her reflection in the mirror in the end it was easier than she expected largely because the poacher swerved to avoid a startled springbok and martine flew over the side she landed in a clump of dewy elephant dung padded grass which had the double effect of cushioning her fall and quickly obscuring her from view it did not however improve the fragrance of her jeans by the time she had established that her left leg was bruised rather than broken all that remained of the poachers was the fading drone of their engine she checked around her for animals in search of breakfast she was not as she'd hoped close to the house but she could see the faint outline of the sawabona sign and knew that she was close to the road with dawn unfurling like a scarlet banner above her head and the birds competing to announce the arrival of another perfect summer's day martine managed a limping jog through the bush to the game gate and was home in under ten minutes usually her heart would have been full of the magnificence of the morning and the fizzing freshness of the air but today all she could think about was the danger jimmy was in and how close they'd both come to falling victim to the hunters a couple of hours later martine had showered and put on her uniform and she was in the process of shoving her jeans to the very back of the washing machine and thinking how nice it was to have the house to herself when she heard what sounded like a stock car race in the yard she rushed outside expecting to see her grandmother returning from somerset west and was confronted instead with an extraordinary sight police were spilling out of two squad cars but that wasn't what stopped her in her tracks in the center of the lawn roped together like the bad guys in a cowboy film were the poachers their ski masks were gone and their faces were as sour as milk but there was no mistaking them tende alex and her grandmother were in a huddle in the driveway talking intently but they broke apart when martine walked up martine thank goodness you're okay said gwen thomas rushing forward her overnight bag and car keys were still on the lawn where she dropped them i've just arrived home to find police swarming all over sawabona alex here has managed almost single-handedly to catch the poachers who have been plaguing us for nearly two years alex martine burst out before she could stop herself her grandmother gave her a reproachful look yes alex she said in an act of extraordinary bravery he shot out the poacher's front tires as they left the game reserve then he radioed for help and managed to pin one of the men to the ground while tende could get there and assist him to catch the other it was nothing ma'am said the game warden that's what you hired me for i just wish i could have done it sooner he put his arm around the zulu soldier shoulders and said warmly 
but I couldn't have done it all without Tenday's help. Martine caught Tenday's eye, but he looked away quickly. Her grandmother glanced at her watch. We'd better get you to school, Martine, she said. If you collect your things, I'll take you in myself. Martine, who in the space of ten hours had ridden a white giraffe, escaped from men with guns, and seen her destiny written on a cave wall, was struggling to cope with this unexpected turn of events. But she went crossly back to the house to collect her lunchbox and backpack. Alex the hero? How sickening! How maddening! Was it really possible that she'd been mistaken about that strawberry blonde troll? She was on the kitchen step when footsteps pounded up behind her. Martine, called Alex, wait up! Martine turned with a scowl, but the arrogance that usually marred Alex's face had been replaced by a puppyish eagerness. Martine, he said, I owe you a huge apology. Over the past year, I've become so obsessed with catching the people who were stealing your grandmother's animals that at times it clouded my judgment. I don't know what came over me the day I drove you to school, threatening you like that. It was unforgivable. But I was worried that a stranger to Sawabona, someone not familiar with the wildlife, might get in the way of my investigation. All I can say is I'm sorry. If there's anything I can do to make it up to you, let me know. He reached into his pocket and brought out an exquisite kingfisher feather. Peace offering? he asked. Martine accepted it grudgingly, but didn't answer. She was remembering the bullet splitting the tree above Tenday's head and the haunting eyes of the fallen kudu. Alex's mouth gave a twist. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. The kudu. Why did I shoot it? Believe me, it hurt me to do it. But I'd become suspicious of everyone by then, and it was a test. I wanted to see how Tenday would react, and he reacted the way a man who cares about animals should react. So he was in the clear. But you never know in this game, where there, when there's a lot of money at stake, even the best can be tempted. Martine wasn't convinced, but then she didn't not believe him either. She decided that the best way forward was to trust nobody and say nothing. After the night's adventures, one thing was perfectly clear. She and Jimmy were on their own.